They say the past is our greatest teacher. Reflecting on the past 55 years and my 32 years, year career in education has been so humbling and has given me such an awakening. God is good and he's had his hands on, on me since the day I was conceived. Even though my parents thought I was a surprise, I was no surprise to God. He had a plan and his ways are good. Although I have, to be honest, I had, I tried to mess his plan up a lot, but in the end, he will always get his way. The battle scars, both physical and emotionally, are signs of a hard fought battle between good and evil. I am a living testament that good will always prevail. Looking back 55 years to 1965 when I was born, as I look back, I just see God's hands on everything. I see from the day that, that I was born, um, I was called a blue baby, which means that my blood was not accurate at the time. So uh, in 1965, a full blood transfusion is not a good idea. So uh, my parents were concerned about it, but you know, through the process of the day, my body healed itself somehow. Um, and I just think that that's, uh, that's where it all started. I think God said, we've got a plan for you and there's no evil gonna take over you no matter how hard you fight. So growing up in, in Park Hills, Missouri, Flat River, Missouri, um, and moving around as a kid, um, life was not easy. And there were so many avenues for me to go away from God and very few avenue, avenues for me to actually walk the, the, the walk that, that I eventually got to. Uh, as a child, uh, our home life was not good. My parents fought all the time. My dad was an alcoholic. Uh, a lot of f social or mental abuse, but very little physical abuse for, for the most part. But in our life, in our home, it was not, there wasn't much joy and happiness. Um, we, I have two older brothers. Um, there was times moving from place to place that the three of us slept in the same bed for several several weeks and uh but we wouldn't stay there long and we'd move somewhere else and but god god had a plan for me that no no one could see um my mom was um she had cervical cancer when i was an infant still so when she went to the hospital to have surgery um my father he wasn't capable of taking care of all three uh, of us we were all young that time i was probably under a year my older two brothers were probably under five my aunt and uncle, uh, my mom's aunt and uncle, uh, were called and they came and, and got me, the, being the baby, and took me to their house and I stayed with their family um, while mom uh, had her surgery and healed. And that was probably the first turning point of my life. My aunt and uncle essentially became co-parents to me. They, uh, my, my uncle was, was a, a, a very good man. Uh, my aunt was a very good lady. And their three children became almost like siblings. Their oldest really eventually became uh, more of a father to me. I grew up um, through my childhood with them. Um, I would go to school on Monday. They would bring me home. I would go to school on Monday at Flat River. Uh, on Friday, my aunt or my cousin would pick me up on their way home from work. Uh, take me to their house for the weekend, and then on Monday, drop me off at home again. And that was that was kind of my life. Why me? Um, because my two brothers weren't that lucky. They they didn't have the outlet that I had. They wound up seeing a whole lot more uh, than I did, and, and being put through a whole lot more than I was. Although I saw a lot, uh, I was shielded, um, and I really didn't know why until I started reflecting and trying to figure out why why me. And, and and as I look back, everything that I'm doing now started at that point. My, my cousins were athletes. Uh, my oldest cousin had just gotten out of the Army. Uh, he coached all the sports. So every weekend we were gone somewhere. He played town team baseball. We would travel. I learned to keep the scorebook. Eventually was even doing some umpiring. I was their manager. Um, eventually, as I got older, I played uh, some stuff with them. But but I just got to see family. I got to see family that loved each other, cared for each other. There was no alcohol at this time in their families. All their, uh, my uncle had, had quit drinking. My, my uh, cousin uh, had not been drinking. I got to see my cousin get married, start a family. I got to see that role model family through, through my cousin Johnny. And it was just, uh, at the time, it was just something that I really enjoyed. But now looking back, it was, it was setting my life in motion. 
that was all good for a while. Um, but then as I got older and started getting more involved in school and, and friends in school, um, I started staying home more. And that's when I really started seeing how bad things really could be. Um, my mom was a prayer warrior, still is a prayer warrior. She just turned 80, uh, and she prays for people all the time. We didn't go to church, but she talked to us about church. Uh, there were times when we would uh, jump on a bus and go to a church for a church revival or something, but normally we didn't know what we were doing. But mom would always tell us things happen for a reason. She'd always tell us that, you know, if you really need something, you need to pray about it. Uh, we'd ask her, how do you, how do we have Christmas this year? And she'd say, well, I, I prayed about it and God provided. God will provide. Um, little did I know that my grandma was a lot like God, I guess, because my grandma was providing a lot of that, but my great grandma. But, but that's kind of a, a, um, a synopsis of where I was at that time. And, um, you know, my mom and dad, as I said, they fought a lot. There were, there were good times. There were times when we would go out and eat. My dad had a good job and uh, we'd go out and eat on a Friday or we'd take a drive on a Sunday. I can, I can remember some good times, but I remember a lot of times uh, my dad worked in Festus and we'd get up and drive up there sometimes in the morning to take him to work before school because he was hung over and couldn't drive. So we would we would drive him to Festus. We'd come back, go to school all day, and then we'd have to drive back to Festus and pick him up. And and then we couldn't come straight home. We'd have to go to the Legion Hall or, or whatever it was there, and Dad would have a few drinks with his buddies, and we'd have some food and play some shuffleboard. And But, you know, at the same time, we're kids, and we're getting home late, and we just, uh, you know, school wasn't fun. Uh, really didn't want to go to school at that point in time. Really didn't like school. Uh, we were moving a lot. I wasn't sure why we were moving a lot, but then I found out why we were moving a lot. My, my dad was pretty promiscuous, uh, and he every time it seemed like he would uh, get caught doing something, we'd, he'd change a job, we'd up and move. And, you know, my fourth grade year was probably the worst year of my life. Um, we had, everything that we had was repossessed. Um, my dad got, got caught messing around, and and uh, my mom, we, we fought, they fought. We went to, uh, to pick him up at work. We met him at work and my mom confronted him. And, you know, it was just a long, long time there. And then a few weeks passed and the next thing you know, my dad's quitting a really good job and we're loading up and we're moving to Salem, Missouri, which is where my dad grew up. And nothing good was gonna become of that. We knew it. Um, as I said, you know, we had everything repossessed that we had owned. They, I remember the day they came and repossessed our car. And as a kid, man, that's just tough watching them. Uh, your car and your furniture and, uh, you know, you're living, now I'm living two hours away from my aunt and uncle, my safe place, my my out. I can't get there. Um, and, and my dad decided we're gonna move to Salem and we're gonna live in the woods um, farming and of course we weren't farmers. We had like a cow or something, you know, uh, and, and, a, and a garden. But that that time in Salem um, was was so bad that you know because my father was back around his family and his friends and and he didn't get any better. And my my poor mom, she just kept hanging on because of her kids and um, it just uh, the, the part that really got me, as I said, was, is I didn't have an outlet now. So now I really got to see and start getting modeled um, of how to treat people the wrong way. Um, like I said, my, my dad's family was, there was no love within that family. My father, you know, my father's a, a, a story in itself. He, he lost his child, he lost his father when he was nine years old. He had older brothers and siblings, but really he was on his own um, and just started going down the wrong road. He was a good man with a good heart. I don't think he knew how to love. I think he did love us. I think he loved us. I think he loved my mom. I just don't think he knew how to love. And that really, that was really some scars that we all had to go through growing up. So fourth grade, we moved about five times that year. I went to four or five different schools, and every time you go to a new school as a 10-year-old, you're having to make your own way, find new friends. You know, people know, people know you're moving for reasons, and, and it's, just, it's just tough. And um, thankfully, after about six months or so, we did move back to the area, so I got to reconnect with my aunt and uncle. 
and, and started to get to go back over there again and, and have a little bit of solace, I guess, is, is the word I'm looking for. But this whole time, there was no God in my in my life other than my mom saying that, you know, pray about this, pray about that, good things happen to good people and things happen for a reason. So so my 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 only knowledge of God is that things happen for a reason. So, I mean, use that for good or bad. There were times when something bad would happen and I'd say, well, it just happened for a reason or something good would happen. I wouldn't get too excited because it happened for a reason. So I never understood the power of of, of God at that time. After fourth grade, kind of moving into the middle school years um, and getting reconnected with my aunt and uncle, I, we got, I, got, I got connected to uh, the Church of God in Leadwood, Missouri. And uh, I started getting to go to, to some youth groups there. And, and again, I didn't know why I was going. I was going to hang out with friends. I was going to have pizza afterwards. I was going to, to you know, I was old enough now I could play some church softball. And to play church softball, you had to go to church either Sunday or Wednesday, and one or the other. And uh, so if I'd miss on a Sunday, then I'd try to get there on a Wednesday just so I could play the next week. But, but it's starting to, at this point in time, I'm starting to see some things. I'm starting to um, get to be friends with the right people, kids who, who really believed in, in, in Jesus. We didn't talk a lot about Jesus um, outside of, of the youth group, but I knew that there was something there about these folks that were different. Those kiddos were different. They weren't they weren't like the friends that I was hanging out with. They weren't drinking. They weren't running around. They weren't getting in trouble all the time. They were good kids. They were singing in the choir, and I was I kind of liked that, but I didn't know how to do that. I got to go to church camp, and 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 at church camp, I remember going to the altar at church camp and thinking, how come everybody's crying and I'm not crying? You know, it's because I didn't know why I was there. It's just everybody went to the altar, so I just followed them. And I was like, okay. So I go up to the altar and, and I sat there and, and I, I fake a few tears and Pastor Watson comes up and asks who we could pray for. I remember I remember it like yesterday and I was like, nah, my mom and dad. And we prayed and we went on and I, then I started telling everybody I was saved, but you know, <laughs> There was no save. It was, it was. I was following the group. I went up there, but I still have no idea what I'm doing. High school and junior high was was tough on me. I'd gotten old enough that I started running around and spending less time with my family. And uh, my mom worked nights. My dad uh, was out drunk, out drinking. Um, so I didn't have any discipline. We didn't have any money. I didn't have the things other people had. The only thing that I could find to make myself a friend to everybody was to be that guy that would do anything. You know, you mention it, tell John he'll do it. And uh, I did some really silly things, nothing illegal really, bad. But I did some things that, you know, that I look at kids now and go, wow, why do you do that? And then I go, well, because I did it. You know, they're searching. And, and the whole time, I mean, I'm, I can look back now and say my first 10, 15 years, I was searching for who I was, who was – out there, where was I going? Was I really going to be that person that that just stayed in that town the rest of my life and worked, um, you know, odd jobs and never did anything? And, and and in my heart, there was something stirring that just kept saying, "You're better than this. You're better than this." And I didn't know what it was, and I really would fight it. And uh, you know, I'd continue to do those things that I'd grown up seeing. You know, my dad was a drinker. Everybody drank. We drank. Um, I never acquired the taste, the, the the likeness of those things. Never really figured that out either. Is why why everybody else seems to like. It. Why don't I like it? What's wrong with me? And uh, so it was it was a battle. Um, when I talk to people I graduated with now, they saw something in me that I never saw. They saw, you know, I talked, they say, you know, you're, you're such a good person. And I was like, no, I really was. I look back now, I really wasn't a good person. Um, I was likable. I was a jokester. And that was kind of how I got through things. But, you know, I started becoming a little bit better at athletics. I started growing. Um, my freshman year of high school, I got cut from the basketball team. Coach Joe Easter always tells me that he's the reason why I played college basketball because he cut me. But that was probably an eye-opening experience because I was probably six foot, six foot one. My brothers were playing, and I remember going to practice and ready to go to practice. And I look on the cut sheet, and there's no way in the world my name's on there, and it, it is. And uh, that was eye-opening. And what it did was it really 
made me make a decision. And that, that time I made the wrong decision. I could have worked harder to get better, or I could have griped, complained, blamed others, and started running with the wrong crowd. And I did. And, and I did. And, and um, you know, when I say run with the wrong crowd, I'm not doing anything illegal, but I'm just not the kind of person that, that I'd want my kid to go out, hang out with. Um, sophomore year rolled around, made the basketball team. Junior year rolled around, made the basketball team. I'm, I'm about 6'4 now. Coach is um, a good man. He's a, he's a good man, and I treated him like dirt. You know, it was always his fault. It was never my fault. I was lazy. I didn't want to adhere to his rules. Um, he tried to give me good advice. I mean, I remember him keeping me in his classroom one day and say, look, the people you're running around with is not the kind of people that's going to make your life good and not the kind of people that's going to keep you on this basketball team. And instead of taking the advice, I got mad at him. And how dare you tell me who I can run around with? And and I just spiraled out of control throughout high school. Um, I look back on high school and I feel like I want to go to my next class reunion and just having a big apology, you know, for being the class jerk. Um, but at the same time, I just knew Everything I was doing was wrong. There was a voice inside telling me that this is not right. You need to be doing something different. But I just kept, I kept listening to the other side. You know, the devil will will grab you, and, and the closer you try to get to God, the devil's going to try and grab. He's, you can fight hard, and God will fight hard for you. But the devil's going to fight harder to keep you away from him. And, and that that was the battle going on right now. And and there are scars. I mean, mostly physical scars that I have. Um, from that battle of right and wrong and good and evil and who's going to win and who's going to lose. And, you know, I'm spending my time playing basketball, but I'm griping about it. And my dad's saying, well, then quit, go get a job, quit school, go get a job if it's not that fun to you. At the same time, I'm in band and choir and I'm trying to be, I'm trying to, to, to do things, be active. And, and I'm really good at both of those. And I never practice. And I was like, well, okay, maybe that's good. But, but then we have a concert and I'd be like, ugh. So I tell my parents, no, don't come. Don't, I'm not. I'm, I'm probably not going to play. And you know, I was first chair trombone and singing solos in choir and and convincing my folks not to come watch because I was embarrassed. So there's that mix there as well. And you know, I think the day that probably changed everything. And I, I tell this a lot. And there's you know, there's uh, it's funny because Coach Bill Bradley. He was a retired basketball coach, and I know people in, in Jackson uh, know his daughter, Vicki, and son-in-law, Greg Lee, um, Dr. Lee. And just walking across campus one day, um, and I'd had Coach Bradley for a sociology class, and we'd talked, and he, he, he knew about my family life, and he just stopped me one day, and he just looked at me, he said, son, he said, I just want you to know that I know what you're going through. And I know that things aren't good. He said, but you're going to do something someday, and you're going to be something special. And I want you and your brothers to know that, you know, I love you guys, and, and, and I want you guys to do well. I don't know if somebody had said something to him, but those words, were it was finally somebody I didn't want to let down besides my cousin. You know, my cousin Johnny, I didn't want to – he was my role model when I think back. I wanted a family like his. I wanted my kids to be like his. I wanted to live like him. I didn't want to disappoint him. But to that point, he was he was the only person in my life that I really was worried about upsetting. When Coach Bradley said that to me, I just kind of went, whoa, why? So I, so I really – the battle got tougher at that time because now – my mind's telling me that there's somebody out there that does care about me, but there's also so many that don't care about me. So I graduate high school. I don't know what to do. Um, by now, I'm I'm six six, uh, skinny as a rail. A buddy of mine uh, that I played high school basketball with was going to walk on at the junior college, um, and I'd been accepted to the junior college. You know. Even though I never studied and even though I really didn't take school seriously, uh, I made good grades. I never took a book home. I made good grades. I was B's and C's, and uh, it's amazing what I could have done if I'd have taken a book home. But So I got accepted to the junior college. Mom and Dad at this time were split up and divorced. Um, so I got Pell Grants, so I got to, got to go to school for free. 
So I went the first year or first day of school. We go out and and uh, and my buddy says, "Hey, I'm gonna try out for the basketball team. Y'all try out." And I'm like, "No, oh, I don't know. You know, it's a lot of work." <laughs> So I did. I tried out, and Coach Seacrest, Bob Seacrest, great man, um, he kept me. Um, I was skinny. And he told me, he said, you know, he said, uh, I'm going to let you be part of the team, um, but you're not going to be playing the first year. You're going to redshirt. I've got some really big guys ahead of you. But, uh, you know, come to practice every day. Keep, you know, stay out of trouble. Keep your grades up, which I didn't. Um, but I practiced every day. I was part of the team. Um, I didn't have a good first semester, but I learned and had a better second semester. And the next year, he gave me a scholarship. But between year one of college and year two of college, now I've grown another three inches. I'm six foot nine. I'm about 225 pounds. So now I'm big enough that I look good getting off the bus. Uh, my attitude still stunk. And uh, for a college coach to give me a scholarship, I don't know why he ever did. And I look back on it. I, it's, it's part of God's plan. Um, did I deserve it? No. Did I earn it? No. Did I get it? Yes. And did it help me um, in my track towards education? It, it did. Um, because it was all I knew then is basketball. And I, I, I really came through that uh, junior college experience and uh, was able to get a scholarship to Central Methodist University and um, got the opportunity to, to get away from home. You know, I'm 20 years old and, and things aren't going well at home. I've done some things that, that really I needed to get out of the area. Um, you know, my heart was broken. Uh, I, I uh, dated a young lady that her mama uh, told me that um, I'd never be anything more than a drunk like my dad. And uh, that kind of set me back. And then through college, I really felt like she was right. But for some reason, God just kept putting me in the right place. You know, Central Methodists, they were so patient with me and allowed me to continue to go to school and uh, put me with some friends that I played ball with um, that kept us in, on the straight and narrow, um, not godly by no means, but at least moving in the right direction. You know, a journey of a thousand miles starts with one step, and I think college was that one step that said, you know what, there's a journey ahead of you. And I'm going to take care of you, but you've got to do your part. And at this, until this point in time, you have not been doing your part. So I have to go to college five years. I have to go an extra year to student teach. So I decided that sixth year, which is odd, people don't go to school six years. But I thought, you know, I'm going to retake some classes. I'm going to get my GPA up. I'll student teach in the fall because if I student teach, in the, or in the spring. If I student teach in the fall, I'm not going to find a job and I'm going to be in the spring with nothing to do. It wasn't about making money. It wasn't about having a career at that point in time. It was fear of having nothing to do. I didn't know what to do after college. Uh, what was my life going to be like? Was I going back home? Was I going to be like my dad? Was I going to, you know, I didn't, I had no clue. But that's when um, the, that next year, um, Bill Sheehan, who was one of our vice presidents at the college, came up and he said, uh, he said, hey, he said, we've got a bunch of refrigerators up in the attic and we want to rent those out to students coming in. Um, I'd like to put you in charge of that for your work study. Okay. All I got to do is ask people if they want to rent a refrigerator for 25 bucks, whatever. Um, I can do that for work study. Dang right. That's easy. That's, that's not like you're washing dishes in the cafeteria. And... That job, that that offer changed my life. Um, I got to rent a refrigerator to this cute little blonde-haired girl from Lincoln, Missouri, beautiful little blonde-haired girl from Lincoln, Missouri, and uh, she stole my heart the first day that uh, that I sold her the the or I rented her the refrigerator. Although I didn't think I was good enough for, her, and I've told her this story. I think that. You know, all the guys were talking about this this blonde girl. Does anybody know who this blonde is? And I was like, well, everybody else likes her, but she's got a friend. I, I, I could probably get her friend but and to, to go out with me, but I don't think I could ever get her to go out with me. And uh, persistence is the key. After trying to get her to go out with me for what seemed like eternity, um, I finally got her to go out with me one time. And... Uh, that's all it took, man. You just got to go out with me once. You know, one time and I'm just, I'm on, I'm like a magnet. I'm just stuck to you. She knew there was no getting away from me. 
but she was the best thing in the world because what she did was she did give me some some hope, um, a vision. Um, her family was a, a, a strong Christian family, which at the same time I still was fighting that battle, but I was starting to see uh, God. Um, I was starting to see what God can do. So we dated, and uh, the next year I graduated. Um, she came along with me. Uh, we decided we wanted to get married and that we'd finish her college after we got married. Um, I got my first teaching job at Silex, Missouri, up north, and uh, found out real quick that, um, well, let's back up a minute. I think where, where I found out where my heart was as an educator was my student teaching. About two weeks, three weeks into my student teaching at Boonville, Missouri, this would have been the spring of 1988. I was student teaching junior high PE um, at, the, at, uh, at Boonville. And I came in one morning. It was about a 30-minute drive. I came in one morning, and I got a, the intercom asked, that, you know, Coach Link, could you please come to the principal's office? And in my world, I'm in trouble because every time I got sent to the principal's office, I knew I was in trouble. So the entire walk from the gymnasium to the principal's office, I'm thinking, what did I do? How do I get out of it? And how do I lie about this and, and, and still stay where I'm at? Because I, I've obviously done something and I have no idea what it was. But I got there and, they, and the, uh, the, the secretary at the time handed me a phone and said, this mother wants to talk to you. You know, I'm 21 years old, 22 years old and no clue in life. And this mother says, Coach Link, and she, and she gave me her name, and she said, my daughter was an eighth grade student in your class. And I said, was? And she said, yes. And this was a Monday morning. She said she passed away over the weekend. She had a heart defect. And my, 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 my whole world just stopped. I mean, I could... I, I see that day, that moment. It's one of those times, you know, you know where you are when JFK died. You know where you were when, when the space shuttle blew up. This is one of those moments in my life that I'll never forget knowing. And she said, all she ever did was talk about you and how fun you were and how much she enjoyed your class. And we would like for you to be a pallbearer at her funeral. That was the, one of the first times I remember talking to God. Not talking about God, but talking to God. Because that 30-minute drive home that day was when I really started saying, God, why? Why me? Why her? Why this family? If you're such a good God, why are you taking an eighth-grade little beautiful girl away from her family? And I really started struggling. And I went, we went, we had the funeral, and I remember this day, this big old burly dad spread out over this small casket of this little girl. And I just remember going, if things really happen for a reason, God, what could be the reason for this? So that started getting me thinking and life moving and like I said and then you know being being with Wendy now and, and seeing her family and the godliness and and, and the Christian values and, and those things and um, that's probably um, step number two in my journey you know of a thousand miles so I get my job I go to silex we we, we, we go to silex for we're there three years. It's a great small school. I loved it. I remember Wendy getting up, and uh, we'd had Kristen at that time and going to church, and I remember me just laying in bed saying, ah, you go ahead, take her. I'll, I'm just going to stay here. And, and, and I look back on that going, man, what were you doing? You know, early years, early years of, of marriage, early years of family, you're not being you, – you, I was not – a good Christian leader in my house. And, um, you know, gosh, if we could go back and do things over. 
Um, from there, I went to Bolivar, Missouri. Uh, had an opportunity. Um, Wendy's great grandfather, no, Wendy's grandfather, uh, was a Methodist preacher, retired Methodist preacher, and he lived in Bolivar, Missouri. And we'd go there and visit a little bit. And a job opened up there as a basketball coach, and I applied and talked to Wendy's grandfather, such a good man, and uh, he knew the superintendent, so he dropped my name. And the superintendent, um, who is it's funny, he used to be the area supervisor here, and most people would know uh, Richard Trout. He just passed away last year. Um, but he was a superintendent at the time, and he hired me. And, uh, you know, so we, that, that moved us to Bolivar, Missouri, where things started um, – I don't know, it started getting better for me as a Christian, but I was still fighting that sinful nature. I was still not a real good husband. I was uh, probably not a good father at the time. Um, I did have her grandfather there, so there again, there's accountability there. You couldn't, I didn't really want to disappoint him. He put his neck out for me. I met some, some really good people at Bolivar, really good Christian people, and we started going to church at Bolivar. And, and, and it's funny because I started, we started going to church, and, and, and you know, I was still that guy that wanted to sit in the back row and just slink her down and not say anything. And, and the preacher at church, you know, we'd be doing a Christmas thing, and he'd say, hey, I need you to read, stand up and read this. And, y'all, oh, it would scare me to death. I'm like, man, I just uh, standing up and talking in front of people? Really? No way. And... Uh, it was funny. Uh, I was I was the king, you know. I was uh, I was a basketball coach. Everybody liked me. Uh, we had a great team. We'd won 18 basketball games. We played in the championship of the Blue and Gold tournament. Uh, we just had Derek, so I have two children, a beautiful wife. Um, you know, in my mind, things are going really, really well. We played uh, on TV in Springfield at, at the Blue and Gold with about 6,000 people watching it. It was really a highlight. And it was all about me, and uh, trust me. At that point in time, it was all about me. I thought people were coming to ball games to watch me coach. Uh, my kids were only good because I made them good. Um, and that was good until one night about midnight, I got a phone call from the superintendent that said, Coach, things aren't going well. It doesn't look like they're going to rehire you. And I was like, what? He said, yeah. He said, there's a couple board members that aren't happy with you. I said, well, they can fire me because I've done nothing wrong and I'll, I'm not quitting. Um, ego right there. So about 2 o'clock in the morning, I get the phone call. You've been not renewed. Your contract has not been renewed. And I'm like, there's no way in the world. I went to school the next day, and I called my team team in. I told them. and You know, I, I threw a fit for a little while. I was like, there's no way. How in the world can you not, you know? But again, God has a way of humbling us bringing us to our knees, bringing us to his, his, his road and not mine. I had no idea what was going to happen after that point. Um, my uncle, um, who raised me, was, was dying of cancer. Um, I didn't know how to handle that situation. Um, didn't have a job. I had two children. I was applying for jobs, couldn't find a job, which made no sense whatsoever. Um, I talked to my athletic director there in Bolivar, Doug, Doug Potts, and Doug's like, I, I don't know why you're not getting a job. I had one superintendent tell me that you're too good for this job. You don't want this job. And I'm like, I don't have a job. I need a job. And he goes, no. He said, you won't like it here. And you you got bigger aspirations than to be here. And I was like, oh, okay. And, uh, and then the funny thing was, the one place I disliked the most growing up was when we lived in Salem, Missouri. And I got a phone call from a person in Salem, Missouri, a superintendent, or I mean the athletic director there. And uh, he said, hey, he said, uh, I heard you're looking for a job. Um, the superintendent there knew the assistant principal at Bolivar, and they were talking with each other. And the assistant principal's son played for me, and we were very good close people, family, friends, and uh, and he reached out to them, and they reached out to me. And he said, we don't have a head coaching job. We just have an assistant coaching job. And I said, well, appreciate the phone call, but I don't want to be an assistant coach. And that was it. And then we went to uh, – we went to Washington, D.C. on a senior trip. They fired me from coaching, but let me, took, let me take 200 kids to Washington, D.C. on a senior trip. And – on that trip, um, 
they called me again and said, hey, look, we're getting ready to go a different direction, but we wanted to give you one more shot. We need a, we need a PE teacher and we need an assistant basketball coach. We just hired um, a head coach and the head coach was uh, had just, you know, had, had a lot of success, a lot of experience, and we'd like for you to be his assistant. And again, I said, no, I don't want to be an assistant coach. I'm going to be a head coach. And that's just, you know, the way it is. And then the last night of the senior trip, I remember going into my motel room and calling my wife, just kind of checking in. And, and I, Wendy basically at that time said, look, we need a job. You either take this job or me and the kids are leaving because we can't do this any longer. And I'd visited my uncle right before the senior trip and at, in the hospital, and he had said the same thing. He said, son, you need a job. Take the job. And it wasn't really that I didn't want to be a head coach. I didn't want to move my family to Salem. I'd been there. I didn't like it. I didn't want my family growing up in Salem. Salem was just not a good place for me in my memory banks. But that was the day, that was the job that God took my took over my life and started, started leading my life. I, as you look back on it, um, I did take the job. I called uh, Coach Shugart and said, look, I'll take the job. I don't know if I'll be there for more than a year, but I'll take the job. Um, we moved to Salem. Um, I became the assistant coach for a year. Good kids, good kids. The head coach was a little controversial. Um, the superintendent's son played for us, and he was a JV player my first year there, so I got to coach him and got to know the superintendent really well, uh, Stan Johnson. Uh, probably the biggest inspiration in my uh, career uh, was Stan Johnson. And he kind of took me under his wing, and I really don't know why he did. I, there, I never really gave him a reason other than the fact that, you know, I, I was a better person at this point in time. I was coaching, teaching, and uh, started my master's program. Uh, and and his son and I had a good relationship, and all those boys and I had a good relationship. And the next year is when things just – when you look back on life, things just really started to click. And – God really started moving the chess pieces around. And so we, uh, going into my second year at Salem, late in the summer, I get a phone call saying, hey, our assistant principal just resigned. Would you like to be the assistant principal at the high school? And I said, I got eight hours towards my master's. I said, I don't have my degree done. They said, that's all right. Don't worry about it. We'll let you finish your degree. And I said, well, can I still coach? Yes, and, and even better than that, we need you to be the head coach because our varsity coach just resigned, and we need you to be the head coach. So you can be the head coach and assistant principal, which is a coach's dream. You're you're making decent money, and you're coaching, and uh, you know as an assistant principal, you still get to coach. So I did that for two years and built some really strong relationships, and that's where my love really for the at-risk kid, my understanding, my appreciation for the at-risk kid, the hope hopeless kids, really started when I look back on it. As an assistant principal, and you know, you're dealing with a lot of kids who, who are struggling at home. They don't have a, a good home life. They don't have a good head on their shoulders. And I found, I started reading more. And, and I read the book, Lead Like Jesus. And I don't know why I read that, but I did. Uh, and it really started pushing me towards shepherding. And Shepherding kids, shepherding my flock, and, and and even for coaching, I had a student on my team that was is a preacher now, and, and Titus Benton. I love Titus Benton. Titus, Titus was the guy on my team that I dubbed the guy that keeps Coach Link from losing his head and cussing. So every time I'd get mad, I'd say Titus, and Titus would come in and try to keep me from losing my mind. And uh, it was a, just a great relationship. But I started to, we started going to church at the Methodist Church there in Salem, and I started really seeing things from a different perspective. I started seeing that, uh, that God was working in my life, that God does do things for a reason, and that if you do pray, that things are start, do start happening for you. But the devil's still there, and don't ever doubt the fact that he's not going to continue to fight and try to get you. And he really, even through this time, as I feel like I'm growing closer to God, he's probably fighting harder to pull me back to his side. And and uh, the the we were in Salem uh, for four years, um, and the fourth year, uh, God God decided that it was time for me to take a different direction. Um, so God. I, I just, things happen for a reason. So late in the summer, 
our high school principal leaves. And I'd finished my master's at this time. I will start my specialist degree. We'd just come off a 26-win season. Um, we had everybody coming back for the most part. I had lost two or three seniors that really were impactful. Um, I really um, I wasn't done coaching. And Mr. Johnson calls me up and he says, hey, how would you like to be our high school principal? And I was like, uh, I'm not sure. But I'll apply for it. So I applied for it. And then as I kept thinking about it, I kept thinking about it, I finally decided I didn't want to do it. So I, I call him up and I said, can I come talk to you? Yes. So I go to his office and I said, you know, I've been thinking and I don't think I really want to be the principal. I think I want to stay as the assistant principal and, and just keep coaching. And he said, well, that's good and all, but we have a board meeting tonight and I've already called a board meeting and you're going to interview in front of the board. So you need to go home and shave and, and get cleaned up. I was like, yes, sir. You know, I, you didn't back talk him. Uh, small in stature, but big in heart. And, uh, I go to the board meeting that night, and I interview, and, and, and Dave Wynn, one of our board members, he just looks at me and goes, Coach, what do you want? Do you want this job or not? And, and, and this was the defining moment. I look at Dave Wynn, and I said, Dave, I don't know. I really don't. I said, but if you want me to be the high school principal, I'll be the best high school principal you've ever had. If you want me to be a basketball coach, I'll be the best basketball coach you've ever had. It was at that moment that I realized it wasn't about me anymore, that God was working, that no matter what I decided to do, if I worked hard and believed it was for a good cause and believed God was working with me, I'd be the best. Not because of anything I would do, but because he would guide me and, and, and I would be in a position to help kids. And anytime you're in a, help, a position to help kids, you want to work hard. I got back home in about 15 minutes, get a phone call, and it's from Doctor or from uh, Mr. Johnson. And this time, instead of saying Coach Link, he said Mr. Link. And I knew at that point in time I was going to be the high school principal. And that road led me to to, uh, to Hartville, Missouri, where in Hartville, Missouri, I was. Uh, uh, it was a smaller school, but it was closer to Springfield, and we wanted to get back closer to Springfield. I wanted to finish my specialist degree. Um, we had uh, again, it was another one of those things where I was laying, I remember the day that I interviewed for the high school principal job at Hartville. Um, I knew that the basketball coach there wanted the job and I figured he probably had the job. And I was laying in bed when the alarm went off and I was thinking, you know, it's cold, it's icy out. I don't think I'm going to go. And I just, I laid there for a while. And, you know, one of the things that I'm learning now is, and, I, and I'm learning the hard way, um, I want to do things on my own. I don't want to listen to other people. So instead of doing what a good person, a good husband should do, rolling over and say, hey, you know, honey, what do you think about this, that, and the other? You know, I just thought I did on my own. And, and uh, as my wife will tell me nowadays, how's that working out for you? And uh, we've all been down that road. So I decided, okay, I'll go. Uh, because if nothing else, if the high school principal or the basketball coach gets that job, then maybe they'll see me, know me, maybe I can go back to coaching. And I'll be the basketball coach there. Hartville's got a great tradition. They've won lots of games, state championships. Um, so nothing to lose, right? So I go. And uh, thinking I may be the basketball coach, I wind up being the high school principal there for three years. Um, the superintendent at the time, Larry Mays, res resigned. And I got my first step into superintendency and was a superintendent at, at Hartville for four years. Uh, Hartville was a, a place where – you know, I've said this a couple of times where the defining moment, but there was, I, I think when you think about Christianity and your walk with God, I think there's lots of defining moments. I think when you, this is one thing that, that, that I, I think makes me different than some maybe, I don't know. Uh, there's some folks I think that there's that one moment where God just grabs them and they just, they go to their knees, they, they start, you know, they, they get emotional and, and, and they know. And for me, it, it was there's so many defining moments as you look through. There was never that one time when I just went, that's it. It was like, no, there's lots of defining moments. And, you know, Hartville was, was, was that point where I really started growing closer to God. We started going to church at Hartville Free Will Baptist Church, and Melvin Moon was the preacher, and he still is the preacher. And I love Melvin Moon so much. He was my he was my pastor, Chris, at that time. He was real. Uh, we'd have good, real conversations. And uh, he knew that my heart wasn't where it needed to be, but he knew that he could help 
me get closer, and he would involve me and talk to me, and we'd at ball games, and um, we just he would ask my opinion on things, and we just started having that relationship. And you know, there was the one aha moment at that time that 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 really I can't explain, and everybody's got those times. But during the time at Hartville, I became good friends with uh, a guy named Shane Kelly. Shane was a Hartvillian. He owned a car lot there in town and just, you know, well, a young guy. He was 34. I was 39. And we just started hitting it off. Our daughters played softball together, and we just had a lot of fun together. And, and he was walking with God, starting his walk with God, and I was starting my walk with God, and we got to have some good conversations. And, you know, we had 9-11 hit while I was at Hartville, and, and, I, and, and, and that's, you know, such a tragedy. But for me, that was tragic, but reality hit the Tuesday um, following 9-11. Um, the Sunday after 9-11, Shane and I went and played golf um, at Rivercut Golf Course in Springfield. We were we were playing. He was bragging everybody that he brought the superintendent or the high school principal at the time. I wasn't a superintendent. He, I brought the high school principal to play golf with me, and, and I was saying, yeah, but I'm not very good, uh, so don't brag about it. We played golf, had a lot of good conversations in the golf cart about God, about the future, about me becoming a superintendent, about him becoming the mayor of Hartville and working together and just our families growing up together and, um, you know, just really bonded that day. I had a really good day. And then on Tuesday, Shane died of a massive heart attack, 34 years old. And I just, I couldn't believe it. He just had a baby had two other children. He was such a big part of that community, of that family. And he was so alive. And he'd gone to the doctor, and the doctor said it was acid reflux. And at home that afternoon, died. And, and I was just lost. It's like, how did this happen? We just played golf. He was healthy. Um, We, his funeral was the defining moment I was talking about. You know, I'm walking with God and, and I'm listening, starting to listen to worship music, you know, that worship CDs had just come out. So I'm listening to worship music. I'm starting to find my solace there. When I'm having a bad day, I would go get in my vehicle and I'd play some worship music and just drive around the district a little bit. But at the funeral, of course, they asked me to be a pallbearer. Um, Melvin was doing the funeral, and there was two things that Melvin said that day that changed my life. The first one was is uh, his kids would always say um, the verse, um, oh, I just went blank. Um, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And he said his kids would always say, the Lord is my shepherd, and I don't need anything else. And that became my driving mantra. I say it today, 20-some um, years later. When I'm having a bad day or something's going bad or, you know, I, I fight anxiety a lot. And when my anxiety starts to really get, grab a hold of me, I just say, the Lord is my shepherd. And I don't need anything else. I don't need anything else right now. And, and it calms me. I remember, I remember even when I was umpiring softball and I'd make a bad call and, and the crowd would get on me, I'd say, hey, the Lord's my shepherd. I don't, need anything, I don't need anything else. I don't need these people. But that has stuck with me forever. And then the second thing was, he said, we all love Shane Kelly. We all miss Shane Kelly. Shane's dead. Shane's gone. He's not of this world anymore, but Shane is in heaven, and Shane is there waiting for us. And if you truly want to see Shane again, there's only one way you'll ever get that opportunity. You have to accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, and you have to confess that out loud, and you have to let him guide your life, and you will have everlasting life, and you will see Shane again. And 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 as I just at that moment, guys, I just looked off to the left of Melvin, and this is I can't explain this, but I saw a vision of what would be God, Jesus, 
standing there in his robe and his thorn crown and his hands out, not saying anything, but to me saying, here I am. I am the way, and you have to come. Man, I just started crying. And everybody thought I was crying because I was sad, which I was. But that moment to see that, and, and, and I fought that. I had fought that for years. Like, no, I didn't really see that, did I? I, I made that up in my head, didn't I? I can see it as clear today as I did then. Him with his arms out saying, come to me. I will give you rest. I will give you peace. I will give you comfort. Come to me now. And I did. Even though on the outside I was still fighting the battles, on the inside I was growing closer to God, stronger to God, wanting to be more like God and Jesus. Wendy and I got baptized. Uh, Melvin baptized us. That was an awesome event to be able to get baptized with my wife. She got re-baptized, I guess, and I got baptized. Um, And then, and then he was definitely not done with me. The good Lord had only gotten started. Little did I know how much he had only gotten started. So I became the superintendent at, at Hartville for four years and then got the opportunity to, to go to, to Fairgrove. Another one of those moments where I really wasn't ready to leave Hartville. Um, I was playing golf in, 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 in Bolivar, Missouri, and the superintendent that was retiring from Fair Grove stopped me on the golf course and just said, hey, I'm retiring at the end of this year. I'd like for you to apply for the job. I think that'd be a good job for you. And I had known him from when uh, I was at Bolivar. And that's the thing about my life. And I keep looking back on all these things. Why did I go there? Well, I went to Bolivar. Well, why was I at Bolivar? Well, I, you know, many reasons you could come up with. But one was the superintendent from Fair Grove's wife worked at Bolivar. We became pretty good friends. She was the home ec teacher, which is always good to be friends with the home ec teacher. They were very good cooks. And uh, and so uh, so Gene stopped me and he said, I'd like for you to apply for this job. I think you do a good job. He, he said good things about me. I got the job at Fair Grove. Um, spent nine great years there. And to see God move in me from beginning of Fair Grove to the end of Fair Grove was even more as I... As I reflected back for this and wrote down all the things that had happened, it's just mind-boggling. But, you know, when I got to Fairgrove, it was still kind of all about me in a way, but not, you know, it was probably more about my kids now. They were old enough. They were athletes, and they were, they were good athletes, and I kind of wrapped myself up into their world. Um, I was a good person. But I was beginning to become a better person. Uh, we had we had started going to church at High Street Baptist Church in in, in Springfield. Uh, Pastor Eddie had become a really good preacher friend, and um, uh, again, it's one of those things where you try to set it in the back, but all of a sudden you just kept getting connected somehow, and they just kept connecting with you somehow. And uh, God was just forcing me to step up and, and step out a little bit. Um, I guess would have been. But some of the life-changing events there, uh, both of my kids had rollover accidents when we were in Fairgrove. Neither one should have walked away, but they did. As I'm counseling them, telling them God has given you overtime now to go and, and, and make, better, make the world a better place, in my mind, I'm telling myself the same thing because there's lots of times that I look back on that, you know, maybe I shouldn't have been alive afterwards that um, God has given me extra, extra time to make the world a better place as well. But um, I... It would have been April, March, March 30th, 2009. I'm sitting in my office late at night, about 8 o'clock. Uh, Board of Education's meeting. Uh, they're in the uh, boardroom without me, which is never a good sign. Um, I wasn't going to lose my job, um, but I had a couple board members who didn't like some of the things that I was doing. Um, and it was all district stuff. They, you know, we we just passed a bond issue, and we were building some uh, athletic facilities and some other things. And they didn't like uh, some of the decisions that that had been made, and uh, and they didn't like the way that sometimes when 
uh, they didn't want to follow my guidance that I would push a little harder than uh, they wanted to be pushed. So they were having a conversation and, you know, anxiety was real high at this time. I'd been through two roller accidents with my children. I was really struggling with, um, you know, is this really what I want to do? Um, board, I had board members that were constantly calling me or emailing me or texting me. And it was just, my anxiety was through the roof. I was just really, uh, I was really angry. And I just, I just, that, that day I just said, God, I can't do this anymore. At this superintendent job, I, I can't do it anymore alone. Um, I've got to have your help. I've got to have you walking by my side. I've got to have you in my life because I can't do it. I can't make these decisions. I can't handle them. I need peace. I need comfort. Board comes out. Board president comes out, talks to me. Everything's fine. We're good to go. We're moving on. Um, the next day, I called our doctor, Dr. Tim Jones. I said, Doc, I said, I, can I, you know, I need an appointment. Went to see him that morning. It's April Fool's Day. And uh, I'll never forget it, April Fool's Day. And I just sat down with him and I said, Doc, I said, I, I, I don't know what's wrong with me. I said, I, I hate the world. I don't like who I am. I don't like, um, my family doesn't like me because I'm just, I'm, a, I'm mad all the time. I'm angry. Um, he said, you got severe anxiety. And I said, yeah, I, I agree with you. Um, you know, if I would see a notification on my phone for an email, I would go straight to it being one of those board members and I would just get so stinking mad or my heart would get in my throat and I would just freeze. And, uh, and, and he said, we walked to it and, we, and there was some depression. Um, and uh, he walked me through some stuff. He, he, he got me uh, on some medication to help me. And uh, I've been different ever since. Um, matter of fact, uh, our older two children, we will tell Cameron, who came along uh, right at the end of our Hartville stay. Uh, that's a story in itself. Love her to death, but she was a surprise, to, not to God, but to us. Um, but our older children will say, you know what? You should have known dad before he got on anxiety medication. That was not the dad you want. You're lucky. And uh, so that's kind of a joke around our house. But but even that was, was was God's hands all over that because less than a, a month later we have a, a derecio a, a storm hit hit Fairgrove High School or Fairgrove District community uh, sustained winds of 120 miles an hour for like 20 minutes and uh, you know had I not had that moment and got on some anxiety medication to keep me at an even keel um, you know I'm standing by my office I hear the the worst noise you've ever heard in your life. And as I open the door uh, to our high school, I see rubble. The roof is gone. I see our assistant principal, Mr. Bell, at one end of the hallway. I'm at the other end, and I'm just yelling out, my God, my God, help me, help me. And at that point in time, it's like I was just walking on air. It's like, okay, here we go. And you know, I didn't know if people were alive or dead. The The ceiling was on top of them. We started moving things. I started yelling, get out, help your neighbor up. Don't step on anybody. And I just don't know what I'm going to see. I look over and I see a, a one of our teachers who's eight months pregnant laying on top of two kids, saving them. And then I see this brick fall. And it's like slow motion watching this brick fall and hit this kid in the leg. We get the kiddos out of that hallway. I run towards the back hallway. I've got two children and a wife in this building. I don't know where they're at. I don't know if they're okay. As I'm running through the halls, I'm looking for my own kids. The breeze flying in my face. Um, all of a sudden, the police chief shows up beside me. We're running through the back hall. I get to the, I tell him, I said, there's kids in the band room. There's kids in the gym. We got to get them out of there. He went to the band room. I went to the gym. I went to the locker room, uh, the girls' locker room. Coach uh, Downing had several kids back in the, where they're supposed to be, back in the shower. Uh, it's dark. Can't see. I told them, don't move. I'll be right back. I no sooner got a flashlight, got back, got them out. Those walls collapsed. Um, we we spent the next several hours, um, you know, getting kids out, making sure they're safe. Uh, miraculously, nobody got hurt. But it was it was May eighth, two thousand and nine, and that was the last day of school that day. So, 
Uh, the coronavirus has won up me to March, but you know, I was the last day of school that day, and that was uh, that was my daughter's graduation year, and and uh, it was just, uh, you know, when people say, you know, you did a great job, I just say, no, God guided me through this day, and, and He did. He, he prepared me for that. He's always preparing us. Every storm that we are in is just preparation for a blessing to come. So we get through that. I get through. Uh, you know, I spent nine years at, at Fairgrove and, and loved every bit of it. And uh, and then, you know, Jackson. Why Jackson? Um, my 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 reason for Jackson is because people in Jackson were praying to God. Um, not that I'm the answer to prayers. By no means am I the answer to prayer. But God was preparing me for what was to come. Uh, my faith was growing stronger and stronger uh, the longer the, uh, that I was there. Um, we were really, um, we were around Christian people. Uh, I hired a lot of people from Southwest Baptist University. Um, all of our coaches were coming in and our principals and administrators, they were all Christian people. Um, my elementary principal had a little girl that was going through a lot and I saw them go from being just a family to being a Christian family. I was starting to see an influence that I could influence other people, still not knowing exactly the entire uh, possibilities, but seeing that, you know, being able to talk about God in a school setting is not a bad thing. You know, after the tornado, um, we, we got to move, or the, the ratio, we got to have our um, graduation at a church, which was really neat. Um, Got to stand behind the pulpit for the first time and 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 do graduation and and to see and be able to talk about God at a graduation because we had just gone through uh, a situation that scared so many people that people were wanting to hear about God. So I was able to talk even in my graduation speech. I was I, I was able to do some scripture and and it was really kind of one of those things. I went, "There's an avenue for this. I don't know what it is, but there's an avenue for this." So the next couple of years, we, we we moved our graduation to High Street Baptist Church, and 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 I just kept every year I would just stick my toe in the water a little bit further, and uh, it just seemed to be right. Um, it just seemed to be what was needed in in our schools. So at at, at Fairgrove, I also got to start seeing. Christian students in the hallways um, and the impact that that has on other kids. It's really when I really think Heroes for Hope was starting to be put into to my mindset. We had a young man named Caleb Schafitzel that was just a great football player. He's an All-American football player uh, at, at uh, Missouri State. But this young man would bring his Bible to school and walk around school with his Bible. He would bring a lawn chair, keep a lawn chair in his locker, and every morning he'd get there for early waits. And then after waits, he'd go sit in the hallway in his lawn chair and read his Bible. And I started seeing the effects that that had on other kids um, and the effect of, of how good him being such a good person, how that affected other people. And I remember the year that, that, that he graduated, leaving graduation, and my son, Derek, would have been probably a freshman that year, and uh, and Derek saying, man, it's going to be tough without Caleb in the hallways. You know, I, I looked at him. I said, well, son, who's going to carry that cross? I said, there's some boys on your team that can pick that up and carry that cross as well. And 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 they did. It was it just kept on. He started that. It kept on. And you know, our FCA group was growing at that school. And and I, and I always say, you know, one of the proudest moments of my life was we had an FCA. Um, meeting one night, we called it, uh, we didn't call it FCA, we called it something else at the time. And um, but we brought all the kids in, the tur churches came in, they fed them, and we're in the old gym uh, of the school. And and uh, they asked Derek and I to give our, our, our testimonies. And Derek got up and gave his testimony. And that was probably the most proud moment of, of a dad's life to sit there and to see his son stand up in front of 80 to 100 of his peers and give his testimony. It was amazing, and and for me to be able to follow that up with my testimony in front of all those kids. So, the superintendent of schools 
talking to all these kids about God and the effects and, and how God's the answer and how you got to walk. And, and then to have 30 or 40 of those kids give their heart to Jesus that night after Derek and I were able to share with them, um, that was the moment when I understood the power that I had to be able to influence children more than just academically, more just than just athletically. So when Jackson opened up, um, I had actually had applied and wanted to go to school at Fort, Fort Osage in Kansas City, and I didn't get that job. I thought I had it, but God said no, and that's okay. I was mad for a little while. But Jackson application came across my desk, and I called my wife, and I said, hey, there's a school in southeast Missouri, Jackson, I'd like to apply for. And she said, I'm not moving. And I said, yeah, but it's a good school. It's a big school. It'd be a great four or five years, then we can retire. And uh, she goes, no, nah, you can go, but we're, I'm not moving. You're not taking me to southeast Missouri. I don't know anybody down there. That's where you're from. You know people down there. And I don't like some of the people, basically, that you know down there, I'm sure. Um, so I said, okay. But uh, little be known to her, I went ahead and sent my paperwork in. Told her, I said, we'll pray about it. And she said, okay, we'll pray about it. But she said, I'm not going. And my prayer was, God, if this is a job, open a door and let me walk through. And her prayer was, God, slam that door as hard as you can because I'm not going to Jackson, Missouri. I'm not going southeast. It's four hours away from uh, her family. Um, it'd be four hours away from our son and our daughter at the time because Kristen was still there. And we're taking Cameron to a school with 5,000 kids from a school with 1,200 kids. I'm not going. So I did what I should do, and I called and pulled my name out of the running for, for the job. I didn't know where they were in the whole application process, but I pulled my name out and was done and just focused on staying at Fair Grove. And I got a phone call on a, on a Monday morning from a friend of mine who I hadn't talked to for many, many years. He was a freshman, my freshman coach in Bolivar many years ago. And I get a call from him, and he's like, hey, just was thinking about you today. Wanted to call you. I, I ran into a, a board member from Jackson, Missouri last night. So congratulations. I said, for what? He said, well, I hear you got the job at Jackson. And I said, I didn't apply. I, I mean, I applied, but I pulled my name out of the hat. And he goes, well, this guy said it's your job and that you you were going to be the next superintendent of Jackson. So you might want to check into that. Okay. So I called Wendy. I said, hey, look. I said, I don't know what's going on here. And I said, this is happening. I said, but I really feel like God's telling me I need to put my my application back in. And so I, I did. I sent Bonnie a, an email and I said, uh, dear Miss Stallman, if you don't mind, please put my uh Actually, I probably fibbed a little bit. So I think I accidentally pulled my name out. Uh, she said, well, no big deal. I've already printed it off and given it to Dr. Anderson. And uh, from that point on, um, I mean, the interview was great. I, I came down. I met the board. I had a great interview because I just I was very comfortable. And uh, I remember the, at the end of the board, at the end of the uh, ev interview, um, Terry Tomlin was president at that time. And she said, is there anything that you'd like to, to add before we – we're done here. And I just told him, I said, well, I said, uh, what you see is what you get. I'm not changing. I'm not going to, I don't play politics. Uh, I'm here for kids. I'm not here for adults. So kids, uh, if adults are mad at me and I've made a good decision for kids, I'm okay with that because you're going to hire me uh, to be the superintendent for kids. And I guess they liked what they saw. And the next thing you know, I'm in Jackson, Missouri. Um, and, and since we got here in 2015, um, uh, God has been working so hard in my life that it's it's just scary. Um, I have turned my life completely over to God um, through that process of, of of just getting the job and moving here. Um, I think just knowing that God opened this door for me and me finally realizing that He is in control. He is the the reason why I exist. Um, he put heroes for hope on my heart. It has, it has done so many good things for kids. He's allowed me to, to do things in our school religiously that a lot of superintendents can't do and won't do. Uh, he's allowed me to walk by faith and, 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 if, and to be strong in my faith, to show my faith, uh, to reach out and go to places that are so uncomfortable for me. And I just, I don't know that well, I know for a fact I wouldn't be without him, and I don't know what the next 
chapter is, but I know he's in control. Um, you know, in October, our October board meeting, and I'd been talk, thinking about retiring. We've done a lot of great things for in, in the last six six years, and you know, a couple of the things that that that, that I'm so proud of. One is the just the the partnerships we have with our faith based community, uh, the partnerships we have with our community, the partnerships we have with our city, that are all built around kids and and families and and, and hope and giving hope to these people and, and, and feeding them and just loving on them and walking with them. You know, my shirt says, hold on, pain ends. And, and, and that's the thing, the story that I want people to know is at the end of the day, it will be better. There's new morning mercies every day. Whatever happened today, tomorrow morning when you wake up, it's a new day. God's still there. God still loves you. And we're able to do those things in ways that can't be done other places. And it just it just really, my heart is so filled with joy from the six years that I've been here because I've seen the impact we have on everybody. You know, we our mission at school is love all, serve all, and we truly mean that. It's not just love some, serve some, it's all. And, and that's so important and so powerful. So, you know, October board meeting Tuesday morning, I just, I just woke up that morning and for some reason I just, today's the day. Um, trust God. He's got another plan for me. He's got another place for, for me and my family. Um, and when I say another place, it's, you know, we don't intend to leave Jackson. I think there's another place in Jackson. But at the same time, I'm his. <laughs> I'm at his will. And, and that's, that's really kind of where I'm at now is, is I, I'm able to do things now comfortable-wise that I never were before, even in, before I got here. You know, coronavirus has been good. Um, if you can make it good, uh, it's horrible for the sickness. It's horrible for the deaths. But it's allowed a lot of people to step back and kind of prioritize. Even though there's a lot of division in our in our country, uh, one of the things that that I've seen through this whole pandemic is the administrators in schools across Missouri that are turning over their lives to Jesus. Uh, I'm a part of two Bible studies on Zoom a week that are just administrators, and, and we and, and we talk about school some, but we talk about Scripture. We 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 pray for each other. We call each other. We we, we, we send text each other uh, constantly, uh, giving each other hope in Christ's name, not just hope in the world. And uh, you didn't see that before this. And I think it's continuing to grow. Um, and, and, and I think we're at a point where uh, in our world, if we will capture this time where it's cool to be a Christian, I think we can make so much headway because even our kids in school, it's cool. It's cool to be a Christian. It's cool to be that good kid. Um, in my business, it's cool to be a Christian administrator now. Um, I think in the real world, people have leaned on God so much now that they're starting to see that it's okay. Let's do this, and, and we can really make a powerful statement in uh, in, in our world by unifying um, as one family of God. You know, um, with God. As the scripture says, all things are possible. And uh, and I'll just, I'll end with this. that says, you know, go back to what I said in the beginning, that I am a living testimony that God has a plan. God's going to run you through storms. God is going to rain on your parade. God is going to humble you. But if you stay faithful, you continue to listen. Sometimes if you'll just be still, that... Uh, God will use you in a way that you never thought possible. And uh, I'm, I'm thankful for uh, leading me to Connection Point Church, uh, to learning and, and, and getting to know Pastor Chris and, and the crew and uh, just understanding that and seeing the servant leadership from, from all of you at the church to reach out to the community and not just be worried about the people that come in on Sunday, but really care and love everybody body that doesn't come in on Sundays. Uh, I'm just thankful.